Good morning, everybody. I didn't get a chance to introduce myself yesterday. I was caught in the Chicago shutdown yesterday and didn't get here till, uh, until yesterday, uh, late afternoon. But I'm Bob Kushner. I'm one of the co-chairs for the program. And I've heard from you and all the other program committee members that it was, yesterday was wonderful, right? And today, I hope you leave some room in your brain for equally great information as you assimilate what you learned yesterday. We have an equally great program today. Um, it's hard to follow that laughter yoga, but Jim Levine's going to try and uh, do so. Uh, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Uh, Jim Levine, who is an internationally renowned expert in obesity, undernutrition, and human energy requirements. His research is focused on the understanding of a term that he introduced into our vocabulary. If you haven't heard about it, you're going to know all about it in a moment, which he coined the term NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Those of you who are familiar with the standing desk and walking desk and so on, you're going to hear a lot about that. Jim has received more than 50 national and international awards in science and a science a scientific advisor to the U.S. government, the United Nations, the government of People's Republic of China, as well as throughout Africa and Jamaica. The guy does get around. And he also has time for us, which is wonderful. Jim is at Mayo Clinic, as well as Arizona State University. It's my honor to introduce Dr. James Levine. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness, I've got two minutes, 44 seconds. I better speak very, very quickly. Hi, everyone. Hi, good morning. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I missed Tai Chi, but I did the, the walk this morning. I think this is either, is it too cold or too hot in here? I'm not sure if this is too. Um, so so um, I hope everyone's sitting comfortably. It's such a, a pleasure and delight to, to be here. Um, I cannot tell you. I, I met with some folk last night. Um, who, who did the painting downstairs last night? Did anyone here do the painting thing where you like a painting class? It was. Oh, I know. I know it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, but I just thought it was so cool. Wasn't that the coolest thing? I just. It's just such a lovely atmosphere. And then, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, anyway, so 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 I hope you're sitting comfortably. Um, what I'd like to do today is talk about. Um, uh, how chairs are killing us, um, and, um, and, and so, so, so here we go. How can something that we, that's so ubiquitous, how can something we do all the time be so harmful? Well, it's, on the other hand, though, it's not a difficult cell to explain that, of course, nutrition was a basic entity in sort of human living, but, you know, excess nutrition or the wrong types of food have become terribly harmful. It's something we do every day all the time. The converse, of course, therefore, would be sitting. Something else we do so frequently, so often, can be so harmful. But now imagine somebody who is predisposed to asthma living in Los Angeles on a high smog day. And um, for that individual with a predisposition to asthma, the smog comes along and get an asthmatic attack. And so it's nothing they did. It's literally the toxic environment they happen to find themselves in. And so here, breathing is harmful. And yet it's that combination of the toxicity of the environment and the predisposition of the individual. And I think that is a model that, to me, is sort of quite an important one that please sort of carry forwards. I'd like to start with a quiz. Um, and for those of you at the back, I'll, I'll read through the questions. Please give yourself a point for each yes. Uh, do you work seated in a chair? Have you ever shopped on the internet? Do you watch television seated for one hour a day or more? Have you in ever internet dated? Do you own a recliner? If you go to a party, do you seek out the chair? Look at your sofa when you get home. Does it have... <laughs> does, does, does it, like mine, have an imprint of your buttocks? Not, I mean, my sofa doesn't have an imprint of your buttocks. <laughs> do, you, do you spend more time with friends electronically than in real life? Anyone with teenage kids knows the answer to that question. Have you ever fantasized about or engaged in athletics when in a chair? <laughs> and so the answer is, if, if you only have one or two points, I'd be surprised, but then you're only a pre-addict. 
if, if, however, you're up at the 9, 10 level, you really are a chairaholic, and, and it's, 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 time, it's time to hear the message and get up. Um, obesity affects, yes, you know, every major country in the world, and, 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 and like many, many, like Dr. Kushner and others, I, I'm honored to sort of, you know, wander around the world and sort of explain the, the blindingly obvious. But more importantly, it affects every family, every family in America. When I'm in clinic, my patients tell me that five times every hour, they're thinking about their weight, how they feel ostracized in society, how they just, you know, it, 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 it is something that affects every single one of us in some way right across the country. How, 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 did, how did this come to be? This is not a fight between those who say excess nutrition is the cause of obesity versus those who say inactivity is the cause. It, it, it is a concomitant effect of two things at the same time, and here they are. Prior to 200 years ago, 90% of the world's population lived in agricultural communities, moving around throughout their, their day. About, 40, about 200 years ago, people then urbanized. There was the Industrial Revolution, and people urbanized. And now more than half of the world's population live in urban centers. 40 years ago was the invention, uh, 1940s was the invention of the modern office. And the idea of the modern office was sort of, was sort of totally made sense is you know, how can I do the most work possible with moving the least? And, and do, do, do any of you here remember those office chairs with wheels on them, right? And you, could, and you had these amazing sort of skateboarder things, people scooting across the office to get to the filing cabinet. <laughs> and now, and now, and now we, of course, we have the, you know, the, since the 1980s, the computer revolution, and we're all now tied to our desks answering irrelevant emails for most of the day. And, 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 and we're not yet quite done, because, because here's an image of a little girl, and it is quite remarkable to me that, that a four- or five-year-old child can, can, func can use a cell phone, a smartphone, better, better than, than, than her parents. That's a pretty scary thing when you think about it. And as all of that's happened, our energy expenditure has progressively declined. Sure, it's true, these are James's data, that energy intake population-wide actually hasn't changed. It's been pretty constant. The only country that's with a documented increase is Australia with 100 calorie per capita increase per day. UK has actually seen a decline in energy intake with concomitant doubling of obesity rates. That's not the point. The point is we've maintained a energy intake with progressive decline in energy expenditure, and so the obesity epidemic must be an association of those two things at the same time. Sustained positive energy balance, too much food for too little activity, too little activity for the amount of food we consume. It's not a fight, that's what's going on. The story really, in terms of the calories we burn, begins with a, a, a guinea pig called Maurice. Interestingly, this historical photo shows a mouse, but actually it was a guinea pig and his name was Maurice and he was owned by Antoine Lavoisier, who's the bloke sort of sitting down looking up at his wife. And what he did is he, he took a guinea pig and he put it in a vat of ice and measured the rate at which the guinea pig melted the ice. At the same time, he measured the amount of carbon dioxide it produced, and he found that the amount of ice melted by Maurice equaled the amount of carbon dioxide the animal produced. And he was the one who sort of came up with this idea that for an animal or a human ultimately to be in steady body weight, their energy intake must equal their energy expenditure. For Maurice to lose weight, because he noticed he was having to feed this animal more food, for Maurice to lose weight, its energy expenditure would have to be greater than its energy intake. Now, interestingly, um, you know, justice is ultimately done, because really all of the work and most of the ideas came from his wife, um, you know, stand, standing, standing on, 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 his, on his right. Um, Madame Lavoisier, and you know, injustice is a good thing because ultimately Antoine was beheaded in the French Revolution. Um, you know, um, no uh, divorce settlement there. And um, so when we start thinking about energy expenditure, how we burn calories, this, this is how an average person burns their calories. The basal metabolic rate is the energy expenditure at complete rest. It's largely determined by your body size. The bigger you are, the bigger your basal metabolic rate. The smaller you are, the smaller your basal metabolic rate. In fact, 73% of the variance is determined entirely by body size. And you can't really change it. The second component is the thermic effect of food. It's the calories, it's the energy you expend converting raw materials into intermediary metabolites. 
It's kind of what you're doing right now if you just ate that breakfast out there. It, 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 that is the energy one expends. You know, feel hot after a meal, that's what it is. It's about 11% of the total doesn't vary very much. The remainder is that energy expenditure associated with activity. Now, of course, as, we, as, as all of us know, the vast majority of people do not exercise regularly. In fact, more than three quarters of my patients don't exercise regularly at all. But even if you do go to the gym three times a week, and I, take, I don my hat to you, were I to be wearing a hat, um, because cause mo cause, cause most people don't do that. But were you to go to the gym three times a week, the data suggests that it takes about half an hour to get there on average, it takes 10 minutes to change the class, it takes about 35 minutes. Then, in fact, the biggest inhibitor to going to the gym after showering, which isn't something that inhibits me too much, is actually redoing one's hair. And, <laughs> and then, and then <laughs> alack, alas, um, actually, when I, when I told a colleague of mine I was coming to Florida to talk today, she said, I hope your hair doesn't get frizzy. And my, respo <laughs> <laughs> my, my response to that was, you haven't seen me for a long while. Anyway, and then you return home. And so even for that hour and a half of going to the gym three times a week, you've actually only done 35 minutes of, of, of activity. And in fact, when that's averaged out per day, that's even just 100 calories a day. And so when you start to think about it, when you start to think about it, most people have no exercise, and even for those of us who do, in terms of a calorie load, that exercise doesn't contribute that much. So nearly all of the variation in our daily energy expenditure and the calories we burn must come from non-exercise activity thermogenesis, neat, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Those people you feel like with very active day-to-day -day lives have high neat, those who are inactive have low neat. We were interested in this phenomenon for the following reason. We took a group of, of lean subjects and, and brought them onto our research center in, in, in Rochester, Minnesota. And there, <laughs> and there after establishing, uh, for those of you from the Midwest, you understand um, how powerful my, I mean, you probably thought I come from the Midwest. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not from Tennessee. <laughs> anyway, so. Healthy individuals, we worked out exactly how many calories each of those individuals require to keep their body weight absolutely steady. And we did that all on the research center. We chemically analyze every food people eat. And then after having done that for several weeks, we then overfeed people by an excess thousand calories a day above their weight maintenance needs. Now, contrary to my expectations, it's actually very, very easy to overfeed people. They actually tolerate overfeeding incredibly well. Partly because we actually had an amazing cook called Martha but that aside, people actually can tolerate overfeeding an extra 1,000 calories a day very, very easily. It's actually just an extra Big Mac and a shake. But actually, I said that actually at a board meeting of McDonald's, and I actually thought sort of, you know, the heavens were going to open up and sort of uh, take me away from here, but, but obviously not. And what we showed is shown on this slide, is on the x-axis, you see, you see how much fat people gained with overfeeding. And you can see what's interesting to me, how much, how variable it is. You have some people, when they overfeed an extra 1,000 calories a day, every single extra calorie is put into their body fat. Other people, and we absolutely despise these people, ate an extra 1,000 calories a day and burnt off all those extra calories. It's all like having a Ferrari, if only. A Christmas present, Mum. Uh, if only, it's like having a Ferrari and it's like jamming it into fifth gear and burning off all the extra gas, right? Some people have this ability to burn off every extra calorie and gain no fat. Other people seem to be predisposed to take every extra calorie and put it into body fat. Those people who burn off all those extra calories are switching on their NEAT, their non-exercise activity thermogenesis. They're somehow moving more. It's extraordinary. Now, I went through, <laughs> from the sublime to the ridiculous, I went through, I went through a great deal of counseling at school um, I'm sure, I don't know if any, anyone else went through, you know, career counseling. You get these sort of questions, what are you good at? You know, they found out like helping people, um, which kind of says so, so I ought to be sort of obviously a nurse or a doctor. Um, but it was quite interesting when you think about it. I mean, how many people do you think on those sort of questionnaires at school say, actually, I hate helping people? <laughs> anyway, so, so I like helping people. But of all those sort of, sort of analyses I went through, not, never, never did it come up that I wanted to be an underwear designer. But... but <laughs> But, 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 but that, is, that, that, that is how it works out. And, and, and as Dr. Kushner said, I come from, from the notorious Mayo Clinic. And these underwear are shown as overwear. 
Now, if you're not entirely sure what the holes are for, um, <laughs> suffice it to say these underwear were, wearing, were worn continuously for 10 days, and yes, they were washed. And, and the underwear are embedded with a whole series of sensors. And these sensors allow us to measure all of the movements of people during the day and during the night. It's sort of quite fascinating what Minnesotans get up to at night. <laughs> but, 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 but time prohibits, time prohibits, and all those webcams are apparently completely not, not going to happen. Here's what the data show. We compared regular folk, no one went to the gym, we compared people who are lean and people with obesity who had regular jobs. And the idea was you could look over the cubicle and see somebody else in the study. So that's who was in this study. No one went to any gyms. And what we found was that people who were those individuals more likely to be lean were those individuals up and walking two and a quarter hours a day more than people prone to obesity. People with obesity, on the other hand, were those individuals who, for various reasons appear to be more predisposed to be seated two and a quarter hours per day than people who are lean. Good news. Good news why? Good news because it demonstrates, forget, no gyms involved, <laughs> no gyms were, 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 were invoked in, in making this talk or harmed. Um, <laughs> it shows that there is a therapeutic window here, that, that it is possible to be up and moving that much more than other people. In other words, there is a tremendous variability in how much we move throughout the day. And for those who are seeking to adjust energy expenditure and ultimately lose weight, here is an opportunity. No cost, no sweat. And we started to think, well, that's like really sort of quite interesting. How is it, how can it be that some people are so much more predisposed to move than others? We figured there has to be a brain circuitry somewhere to do with this. So we came up with a whole series of hypotheses as to how the brain was actually wired physiologically. And here are our hypotheses. Well, hypothesis one is that the brain is neurologically connected to computer screens, that the brain is neurologically connected to money, that the brain is neurologically connected to Beats headphones or any other brand for that matter. A bizarre idea came from, from, from one of the structural biologists that somehow the brain is actually connected to the legs. Uh, or the smartphone, or ultimately the telephone. And, and, uh, and, and, and contrary to all of our own expectations, number four proves, proves to be the correct answer. The brain is actually connected to your legs. It, it took sort of you know, multiple NIH grants to prove this, but this proves to be the case. Sorry for those of you who just have breakfast. These rats are called Mark. We had, but there were so, many who went through these experiments. And, and, and Mark um, is not wearing a religious head covering, but has actually got a needle that penetrates the paraventricular nucleus of his hypothalamus. This is an extraordinary technique where these needles can be placed right at the core of these animals' brains. I mean, obviously, we tried to do this in medical students, but it just wasn't possible. And, um, and, and what Lana's doing is she's holding, you can see Mark is completely awake, she's holding his head between her finger and thumb. These animals are well conditioned to doing this and actually it doesn't harm or hurt them. And then in her right hand she's got a cannula and she's in introducing micro amounts of, of, of chemicals to ask the question, could there be chemicals? Could there be brain chemicals that explain why some people are more predisposed than others to, to move or to be seated, to be addicted to the chair or to be chair liberated, if you like? She then takes Mark and places him in the cylindrical chamber you see there. And that chamber enables us to measure the need of the animal, the non-exercise activity thermogenesis of the animal. Now it transpires after Lana left, and actually she joined the Marines, which is sort of quite interesting, um, that the reason all the rats were called Mark, it was the name of her ex-boyfriend. <laughs> and, indeed, and, and unlike the real Mark, what we were also able to do with, with, with the um, rodent marks was to continuously video them during all of their activities throughout their day. So we really knew what these rats get up to. The rats with the red dots are those inbred 19 generations. You can see why we can't do these experiments in humans for leanness. The rats with the blue dots are inbred 19 generations for obesity. And what you see on the, on the chart, on the, on, the, on, the present, on the chart, is something sort of, I think, quite interesting. The blue dots 
what's happening to the animals with the blue dots is they're being injected. Lana is injecting into the middle of their brains increasing doses of one of the chemicals that in fact drives NEAT, Orex. And there are about five chemicals that are now being identified. She's introducing this right into the center of the brain. And what you can see, I can't reach the screens. My, my arms really just aren't big enough. Um, and I don't think I'm supposed to move from this lectern. But what you can see is that the blue dots go from about 1,200 yeah, to about 1,400. So when you inject a, 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 a rat inbred for obesity with maximum doses of orexin, his movement increases by 200 neat points, if you like. The red dots, look at the red dot change. The red dots change, those animals inbred from leanness, from 1,300 to 1,700. That's a 400 change. So it's kind of interesting because it suggests that the animals inbred for leanness, their brains are more sensitive to move it signals. So they get a dose of move it signal, orexin. They're going to go crazy. Right? The other, that's my best imitation of a rat. Yeah, it was, it was good, wasn't it? You've obviously, you obviously have a, you know a lot of rats. Uh, <laughs> let's not go there, right? Um, animals inbred for obesity, on the other hand, get the same dose of a rexing signal, and open the New York Times, art section, here we go. There's a difference in brain sensitivity. So there, yes, there's a biology at play. There is a biology that explains why some people are so much more different, so much more predisposed to have high neat and resist weight gain. Others are more predisposed to be, respond to chair-based signals and sit more and ultimately gain weight. But it isn't just that. It's obviously our environment too. Remember the smog analogy and the, asthma, the individual predisposed to asthma. Well, when I think about environment, there's more to environment than sort of just cubicles and so on and so forth. We have to also think about the economy. You'll see how poverty links to sedentariness. If that's my mum, tell her I'll definitely call back. Um, <laughs> now, I wouldn't put it past. She'll find me. She can find me anywhere. I don't know how she does that. Anyway, and if, she, and if it is my mum, please tell her it's a red Ferrari, of course. Right? Um, but there are lots of things that predispose our environmental predisposition to be sedentary or active. It's not just our cubicles, but it's, it's transportation, it's the economy, it's the weather, it's the beautiful... If it was pouring with rain this morning, I would not have taken a two-hour walk, right? Our jobs are a major driver of our need. If we would take a group of chair-based, sedentary people, much like most jobs actually now in, in fact, the developed world, just over half of jobs in the developed world are actually behind computer screens all day. The neat there is about 300 calories. If we were to transpose people into agricultural communities to live the way we originally lived, moving all day long, that would be 23. There's a 2,000 calorie difference in an inactive job over an active job. Merely the job you happen to have. How do we know this? Well, we went out to Jamaica, indeed, to Jamaica, the things one does for work. Yes, <laughs> heart bleed, bleed, thank you. Um, and um, we went out to banana plantation, and what we did is we took those magic underwear and we gave them to loads of folk in the banana plantation. <laughs> and I'll tell you, every time I say that, it sounds funnier and funnier, but is it really, that's really what we did. One guy got arrested, interestingly, because, because all of these sort of wires and things, they thought he was actually carrying a, an incendiary device. You can't say the B word anymore because, you know, NSA is listening. Anyway. Um, he was, they thought he was carrying an incendiary device. He got arrested. And we, and we actually had to get the Minister for Tourism to get him out of prison. By, by, and we took that day's data out of the analysis, and the rest of his data are in. And what you can see, look at the green bars. So when people live in agricultural communities, they move 5,000 walking units per day. And when they urbanize, they get jobs in inner city Kingston, the capital of Jamaica, interesting place. They halve their amount of ambulation, and those individuals actually compare very well with lean individuals living in modern America, and those individuals, as we already know, are moving two and a quarter hours a day more than people prone to obesity living in modern America. Look at B. B is sitting time. So sitting time in people living in natural agricultural communities, and we didn't just measure people on the plantations, we measured people in the villages, we had a dance, we had all sorts of hair cutter, all sorts of quite interesting, quite cool people. And what we found is that their average sitting time is three hours a day. The average American sits 13 to 15 hours a day. Like, yeah, like 50, like 10 hour differential 
Of course it's not good for us. That's why we need grants to prove the bleedingly obvious. If, however, you look at data, now these are zip codes. There are 3,319 dots on this chart, and I know at the back you're busily counting them, but I assure you there are. And what they are are zip codes, and this is what we did with CDC. And on the x-axis you can see how obesity links to sedentariness. In zip codes with higher obesity rates, there is more sedentariness. In zip codes with lower obesity rates, there is less sedentariness. Not choices, not gym memberships. Zip code, where you happen to find yourself living. Now, when you then overlay that, and I, I, I kind of figure this is kind of what you unfortunately anticipate, now what you see are those 3,319 zip codes in quintiles. In the poorest zip codes, shown in number five, you have the highest obesity rates and the highest sedentariness, and the highest rates of sedentariness. In the richest zip codes, the richest communities are the lowest rates of sedentariness and the lowest obesity rates, and diabetes and so on and so forth. Not personal choices. Where you happen to find yourself living. I did quite a lot of work in inner city Cleveland. We had these amazing projects. We were working in streets. I hate this timer. This t I've got this huge timer. Like, it's shouting at me. No, no, I want to tell you this, because it's really, really interesting. So, so we were working in these streets, and a third of the homes were being foreclosed upon. It was just horrific. The communities were trying to band together. It was, and we were in these communities, and we went to um, the, the different counties, and we bought these, these, these plots of these, these sort of disrupted homes. They were leveled, and we built these sort of climbing frames, and they were like mini gyms for kids. Local, community-based playgrounds for children. Sounds like a good idea, right, apart from the fact that several of the you know, blocks, you know, when they, the wood was delivered, it got stolen. Forget that for now, it's not relevant. <laughs> so we built them, and then, and then, like, duh, we built them first, then did the focus groups. Like, like come on. <laughs> Who runs this stuff? Anyway. <laughs> what the mums told us is they're not going to, they're not going to let their kids go there. They're not going to let your kids go there. It's just down the road. Kids are going to get shot on the way. And not only are they going to get shot, what we found was that the drug dealers use these climbing frames as lookout posts. They'd climb to the top of the climbing frame, the monkey bars, and they'd stand there looking out for the cop cars as they were dealing underneath. And what was really cool for the drug dealers was that when the cop cars came, they could run into the houses, sort of to the back of these little playgrounds. Right? But it tells you everything you need to know, right? These urban... It's an, there needs to be an intelligence to rebuilding these communities, and it needs to be done in a way that's sensitive to the actual needs of the communities. But it's not just our work, it's not just the communities we find ourselves in, it's also this concomitant pounding of tools of convenience. This is an anachronism. It's, it's a man washing something up. And what you see listed on the left, and we were measuring the calorie burn associated with all these different tools of convenience. And think about it, we charted 70 tools of convenience that a person can use before, before they get to work. Who hand winds their alarm clock? Who hand grinds their coffee? Who doesn't make coffee by pressing a button? When you answer your mail at home, you click it open or do you walk down to the mailbox and the list goes on and on. I mean, who brings in wood from outside to heat the water in their house, right? Hmm? And of course, you know, just the, I, I mean, think about it, right? I mean, as my, as my grandparents would say, may they rest in peace, Mr. Gus, the idea, you drive to work, okay, bad enough, we used to walk, or take a horse, drive to, imagine doing that, anyway, <laughs> along that, what, Highway 4, anyway. You drive, you know, the, the idea of the drive through is an insanity, but we all do it. And so you start adding up all the calories from all these different things, and you realize that as soon as you get somebody up off their bottom, remember that 10 hour a day differential, right? You've got 
And the natural way of moving is to move 10 hours more than we do. And for every hour you're up and moving at about this speed, which is the average median speed of a, a human being, you're burning about 130 calories an hour. And no wonder we are so energy deficited. No wonder, therefore, we're in positive energy balance. And no wonder, therefore, there is an obesity epidemic because of all of these tools of convenience we've ultimately been seduced to use, but also, ultimately, we're not just seduced to use them. Society is built in such a way that, yeah, we have choice. Well, you, you can't ride a horse to work, and most of us can't actually have a choice but to drive to work, let alone to sit at work, let alone to sit. And so you, it all adds up. And we do a lot of work on Native American reservations. This is the tribe of Ojibwe in northern Minnesota. And uh, auntie is how she refers to herself. Frances Maple Staples explains a way of life that my children, unfortunately, cannot even conceive of. Born in 1928, Elsie and Barb were her sisters. My family did logging there and picked rutabagas um, when it was rutabaga season. And they picked those by the bushel. I mean, the best I can come up with is Trader Joe's, right? <laughs> right? I mean... It was beautiful. We had to work all the time, help our parents outside in the heat and sun. You know, my kids help me all the time, but generally it's how to do a PowerPoint, how to do a download, what's app, or what's up, or I can't remember what it's called, but that app, my kids put, but they don't help me outside in the heat and the sun, and they don't go hunting with me, right? And they certainly don't wash socks on a washboard, nor do I. That was tough duty, those socks, they sure get dirty. So when I wash my clothes, I take them and I put them in a machine and I press a button. Now, in the olden days, in the olden days, right, in the olden days, when my hair did get frizzy, I used to lift up from the ground a tub of Tide and I would pour it into the machine, <laughs> right? Now, what do I do? I take a pod <laughs> and I put it in the machine. In the old days, remember these days, I used to go down to the supermarket and buy a tub of Tide and pour it in the machine. Now, it's one click away. I click and the pods appear on my doorstep. <laughs> Laugh not. They are so good at this. I don't even anymore need to click because I have my pods on auto order. They know how many pods I get through. And if I'm really lucky, I'm going to get one of those little robots that kind of move around your house, and the robot will pick up the pods and put them in the machine for me. But there's more. There's much, much more. You guys should have given me more time. I should just speak much more quickly. I did this focus group in Iowa, middle school kids. This boy comes home. He, this boy's in our focus group. He tells me this. He tells me, he says, um, he, he explains that he hates, he, his parents got divorced. Not, not a strange thing. He hates his new mother. That's not strange, unfortunately, either. And, and I, so I say, you know, how do you deal with your stress? How? And he's a focus group amongst his peers, right? And he says, you know what I do? He says, I get home from school, and when I feel like totally stressed out, I go into the basement, kill, kill five people, and then I come up for dinner, right? Now, any of us who, who know what you know, modern video games do, I know exactly what he's talking about, right, instantly. Where I play, playing outside, kicking a ball around, hanging out with your friends, Be, get, getting into trouble, right, hanging out in the farms. He kills five people and feels better. And this is a fundamental thing wherever I, all these places I'm honored to visit, whether, whatever, we work in five different school districts, blah, 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 I visit all the states, blah, blah, blah. But wherever you go, this is what you see amongst children in particular and in adults even more so. This consistent sense of isolation, the isolation between the continuous stream of screen-based information that really gets us nowhere and gets us nothing, right? I mean, if you really analyze, and big companies have now done this, what percentage of these emails we do are actually irrelevant, what do you think the number is? How many emails do you actually think are actually have no proven product base at the end of the email stream? They actually, the answer is about 
So this sense of isolation you can sense when you walk into cube land, the sense of isolation you get when you talk to these kids, whether they're in inner city Cleveland, whether they're in farms in Iowa, it is heartbreaking. It is utterly heartbreaking. And we're all chair sentence. There's a problem. It's a, it, it, is, it is the modern curse, the modern curse. Why is it important ultimately on a health basis? Now this curve is the diabetes curve. It, it, it's millions of people with diabetes, God forbid. But what I want you to see, however, is like a lot of curves, it doesn't matter what it is, the economy, blah, blah, blah. A lot of curves, you can actually see the top of it, right? You know, you can see the peak of the mountain. This is the diabetes curve for the United States. And probably like Dr. Kushner, we're seeing like 16-year-old kids, because I don't see pediatrics, who, who are on to have to have adult type, type 2 diabetes. Every healthcare provider in the United States See, are seeing children with type 2 diabetes. In our inner city Hispanic program, one in three children already have elevated blood pressure. 21% have obesity. And the point is, we haven't even seen the tip of the curve yet. Now, why is diabetes so linked with sedentariness? What's actually happening? Very simple experiment. Dunstan has done beautiful work on this in Australia. This is Manahar's work. He took a group of regular folk and did a very simple experiment. He, he gave them breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And he said, I want you to do what the average person does. Have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And now I want you to go and watch TV. Not a big challenge. Now, on the second set of experiments, what he did was he said, I'm going to give you breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I want you to do one thing and one thing only. I want you to take a 15-minute walk at one and a half miles an hour. This, this is one and a half miles an hour. It's a stroll after your meal. And I used to do this with Grandma Gags in Rustington, albeit she used to smoke a cigarette after dinner, but, but <laughs> we'll take that out. <laughs> Edit that out of the stream, right? 15-minute walk after each meal. Here's what the data show, and it's those, sort of those mountainous things on, on the sort of top left there. If you sit and eat a meal and then kind of watch TV after your meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the big mountain is what you get. And what's on the x-axis is minutes, up to four hours, and on the y-axis is blood sugar. So the area under the curve is the postprandial glycemic excursion. That is how much sugar your system is seeing after you eat a meal and watch TV. And if you do what Grandma Gags used to do, forget the cigarette, but take a 15-minute stroll after every meal, which, think about it, is totally natural, right? We used to have lunch in the field so you could go back to work. It's obviously how it's meant to be. You halve the postprandial glycemic excursion. You halve it. The biggest risk, if you look at sort of how you predict type 2 diabetes, it is the postprandial glycemic excursion that predicts type 2 diabetes. So, of course, Sedentariness is linked with type 2 diabetes. Doubles the risk, in fact. Look at multiple big studies, 800,000 people. A 15-minute walk after every meal. And don't tell me this isn't going to change your life. It changed mine. You halve the postprandial glycemic excursion. And it's not just diabetes. This is the sort of the pub, these are the publications from the scientific community that have come over the last 15 years. And what you're seeing is this, there are now 10,000 publications that link a whole slew of chronic diseases and conditions. There are 34 of them linked to sedentariness. Yes, diabetes, yes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure. It goes on, breast cancer. Low mood, depression, this sense of stultification, this sense of isolation, low sexual zest. It is all profoundly linked to the fact we have taken upon ourselves, we have been seduced into this sedentary way of living. This is a little girl, age three. She's sitting, her left hand is in a packet of chips, and between her ankles is a screen, and she's watching a movie. Unimaginable. This is a New York street. Imaginable. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm giving a, a seminar later today where we're going to talk about solutions. 
but it is, I hope I've convinced you, I hope that it is clear that sitting is a modern curse, and what is really powerful here, and what is the real opportunity, is we can individually get up, we can individually improve our health, we can help somebody else get up, and we can help them improve our health, their, their health. And if somebody, I have to tell you, reaches to you and says, come on, get up, do some laugh yoga, do some tai chi, go for a walk. Don't say, I'm stuck on this chair, I've got some email to do. Say, yes, I'm going to get up. Thank you. How great was that? I, I tell you, we, we preach neat in our clinic. It, it, it's absolutely true. Anytime you can get up and move, you want to get up and move. I want to thank our live stream individuals who have joined us. I also want to thank Covidian for providing the resources for that live stream so we can bring this great world um, this news and these speakers, which is absolutely fantastic. I also want to let you know where we're at on our virtual walk. Have you guys been texting in your steps? Yes? If you haven't, look at page 19 in your program. The, the number is there to be able to text in your steps. We have gone 609 miles, and we now currently are in Raleigh, North Carolina. Closing in on our final destination of Washington, D.C., where we can make some change. I'd like to welcome up our next speaker, Dr. Michelle May. She's a retired family physician and a recovering yo-yo dieter. 